<laughs> oh, sorry, he hasn't arrived. He hasn't arrived. <laughs> so, David, we have our own David here to give us a lecture, and as you can see there, calligraphy, codes, and catastrophes. See, all these big words, they don't really confuse me. <laughs> Catch me out, and my teeth are slipping. Okay, folks, without further ado, I'll give you David. Normally I'm at the other side of the camera, but for tonight, and one night only, as Uncle Gable says, that's it, I'm not doing a second, I'm not doing an encore, so count yourselves lucky. <laughs> I'd like to talk about, a little bit about calligraphy and how it came about, and how it evolved into codes and communications. First of all, my apologies to Anne, if I mispronounce any of the words, because it's all Greek to me. <laughs> now, any of you lucky people who spend time in the Greek islands will be familiar with Cali uh, meaning good. So you have Cali Sperda, which is good evening or good afternoon. Greek, Greek. Greek, yeah. You, you have Cali Nicta, which means good night. So the important word here is Cali. Moving on then, we get Calligraphos, which means good writing, with a K. Sorry, sorry, Mike. And what we have done is we've changed Calligraphos to a C, which becomes calligraphy. So it's just all about good writing. Where did calligraphy come from and how old is it? Some attribute writing to the Chinese who use the shells of turfets which they heated for the purpose of divination or the scapula of oxen. What they did was they heated these up until they cracked. They tried to interpret all the, the crack. The thing was that the local king or emperor could in fact modify what the results were. Questions had to be a simple question, just like the lotto ad, where you see the gurus on the rocks, and the young fellow says to him, is it going to rain? And, and he says, no. Then book it's down, he says, oh yes. Then it stops raining, he says, maybe. So th th this, this is what would happen with the emperor. They'd ask him, is it a good day for planting crops? And of course, the emperor would manipulate the results to suit himself. To make them permanent, what they did was, they coated the shells with cinnabar. So initially they started to use paint, but they found this was more permanent. This was about 1400 BC. The only trouble was, as I said, the emperor could and did manipulate the results to suit himself. But it is generally accepted that writing began about 3,500 years ago in Syria, where, all, where ISIS is at the moment. The Fertile Crescent, which is the green band. In this Fertile Crescent, we had several places which are mentioned in the Bible. For example, down at the very bottom, you have Shaldi. So you have the famous Ur of the Chaldees, which is just there on the bottom right hand side. This is where Abraham lived, and he lived there for many, many years in Ur. And he was told by God that he was going to be the father of a great nation. Next to that we have Uruk, U-R-U-K, where the first pyramid was constructed. The pyramid was what they call a ziggurat. We're not familiar with the pyramids like that, the pointed ones. But this was a stepped pyramid. You have Babylon there, Iraq. You had Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a great city, which took three days to cross. It was a huge, huge city. But because of the wickedness of the people, Jonah said that the Lord would destroy the city in 40 days unless they all repented. So they all put on sackcloth and ashes and, of course, repented. You have Babylon. Babylon is the site of the Tower of Babel, for obvious reasons. Uh, the people wanted to build this ziggurat, this step pyramid, which they thought would reach up to the sky. And the gods were very angry about this because, I'll quote later on, they actually were annoyed with all the noise and babel that was coming from mankind. So what they said was that they would destroy mankind. How did writing actually come about? Writing was developed by Semitic people living in or near Egypt, based on the ideas developed by the Egyptians, using tokens 
to represent sheep. There you have the tokens on, on the left hand side. Sheep, cattle, and so on like that. And also to record the great deeds of the pharaohs, which you, you can see in the hieroglyphics later on. This alphabet was quickly adopted by their neighbours to the north and east, the Canaanites, the Hebrews, and the Phoenicians, to record crops. The earliest symbol that we have of crops is this one. Now, this one is about 3,000 years ago. And if you look at the little green dot in the circle, that's the symbol for barley. That's the first recorded symbol for barley. Again, that's an explanation of the hieroglyphics. The Phoenicians spread out that to other people in the Near East. So there's the alphabet. This is based on, as you can see, the Greek there is on the right hand side, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on like that. But prior to that, we had a cow's head. So that was Aleph, which became twisted sideways and became A in Greek. Same too. That was the symbol for Nox. Beth was like shape of a house. Again, over centuries and millennia, that became twisted left and right and upside down back to front. The other one is Gimel, which look, looks like a throwing stick or a boomerang, but in actual fact may have represented a camel. So the last one there is Daleth, the door, which may have originally started off as looking like a fish and then gradually morphed into D for delta in the Greek. The next one then, He, is an astonished man. I'll come back to him later on, so just keep him in mind. This was actually spread to other peoples in the Near East to, and to Asia Minor, as well as to the Arabs and Greeks and the Etruscans who lived in northern Italy and as far west as present-day Spain. Ancient Iraqis had no writing paper. That didn't come until much later, when the Egyptians invented uh, paper pounding papyrus reeds together. But they had clay, lots and lots of clay, which they inscribed. Here is a clay tablet. Uh, it's very, very delicate, so if you pass them on yourself, it's supposed to be 1,500 years old. But if you like to have a quick look at it, Have a nice day on it, so I have my doubts about it. <laughs> so you can imagine some scribe someday saying to the master, Your Highness, to speed up the word of recording your taxation and to make it more efficient at remembering who paid and who didn't pay. Because bear in mind that all of these early ones were offerings to the temple. So they would record that Paddy gave 500 oxen or whatever. And they said, why don't we record who is withholding their taxes? And we would record the information on a cylinder made of clay, which you're, which you're examining, using a symbol like the shape of a cow's head, which is Aleph, which the Greeks called Alpha, to record that Ishtar gave two head of oxen, or Beth, to record that this is possibly a reed house, to record that Mustafa owned a small mud hut. Or C. Gimel, which is the third one down, the Greek gamma, and to record that Simon owned three camels. So even in those days, they were recording for taxation purposes. The Etruscans who lived in North Italy had no G sound, so they used it for the K sound and passed it on to the Romans as C, the letter C, who added a short bar to it and made it a G. The next letter is, as I said, the door which may originally have been a fish. Now, moving on down, the next one then is shin. It's not actually shown there on the screen. But it looks like a bow. And it turned to the Greeks and called it sigma. The Romans simply called it S. You take the first four letters of the alphabet. Yeah. So you get aleph bet, which morphed into alphabet. So, Egyptians also developed a system of counting over the centuries, morphed into 
what they call cuneiform writing. I'll, I'll explain by that later on. And that's the cuneiform you're looking at at the moment on, on that cylinder. So there's, there's the full alphabet, A, B, C, D. And that dates from about 3000 BC. About 2800 BC, it had been turned on its side, and by 600 BC, it had become the cuneiform shape. Started out, it was two parallel lines, which was water. Then it became twisted into two parallel lines, and finally it, it emerged as cuneiform. There you have it again. There's a comparison of the Arabic, Hebrew, Syriac and Greek. So you have Arabic al alif, the Hebrew is alep, the Syriac is alap, and the Greek is alpha. So you can see the way they're all connected. The ba, bet, bet and beta. Gim, gimel, gamel and gamma. There is a common ancestry in all the languages. The Egyptians also developed a system of counting up to a million. On the left hand side you had one, two strokes were two, so on five. Then they had a coil of rope or a heel, heel shape. In this case it's a heel shape which was 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. They used then a coil of rope. So they had 100, 200, 300, so on up to 500. Then they used a lotus flower for a thousand. So we had 1,000, 2,000, 3, up to 5,000. 5, the top one there is 46,206. So you're reading from the right hand side. If you look at the fingers there, there's four fingers, which is 40. The six lotus flowers, 6,000. The two coils of row, 200, and the six units. So 46,206. There's some other one now. The top one there in D, is a series of tadpoles. And underneath again you have the finger. And if you count them up, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven tadpoles, which is 700,000, and the fingers are 60,000, so you have 760,000. They also had a symbol for a million. And this is the astonished man that I said earlier. So you can imagine if the tax inspector came to you one day and said, oh, by the way, you owe us a million. That would be your reaction. <laughs> How it was cuneiform recorded? It was done by making an impression in wet clay, as, as the, that sort of clay that I've sent around, with either a triangular or a round styles, which was made of a reed, and which is called in Latin a cuneus. And that led on to a shape called, in Latin called a forma. So putting the two together, you get cuneiform, and that was a particular kind of writing. Cuneiform was a mixture of, where did you hear all this? Sumerian, now that's, you saw Sumer there in, in the map earlier on. Persian, Babylonian, Phoenician, and in Hebrew that was ancient Canaan, or Canaan, and Hittite influences. This may all sound, this is from modern day Iraq. Now this may sound a bit fanciful, a bit far-fetched. But we have preserved in the Louvre, from the time of Hammurabi, who, dated, who lived about 1750 years BC, we have these tablets, exactly the same as the one I passed there. What happened was, these were meant as temporary things to record it, but there was a fire in the library on one occasion, and all the tablets were baked hard and have been preserved. They date from 1750 years BC. And there are nearly 300 tablets with cuneiform writing in the Louvre. And they gave laws about holding land, wages to be paid to a driver of oxen, paternity regulations, retribution if your son was killed by a neighbouring tribesman. Anyone familiar with an eye for an eye? So if a neighbouring tribesman killed your son, you put out his eye. Divorce. And here's something very important as well. How it took fur or fine and remove judges if they made mistakes. Wouldn't that be lovely now? If you could do that nowadays, if a judge makes a mistake, and let's, let's let you go to your office, mm -hmm. suspend a sentence when you know you should have got six years, that you can have them removed. This was written in the Arcadian language. There's another example of it, the cuneiform. 
and dates from about 3000 BC. This was actually done by this guy. I, I love his beard, by the way. He's a gorgeous uh, Hammurabi. And he was known as the lawgiver. Now, he lived about 1776 years BC. And he was a Babylonian guy. There's also extant in cuneiform the story here of Gilgamesh, which was written about 3000 BC. And there is Hammurabi on, on the, on the right-hand side receiving the laws from the goddess of law, justice and order. And this tells the story of the hero Gilgamesh and deals with the story of the flood. <coughs> On the table over there, there's a small example of the story of the flood. Um, it's the only one in existence because I got this from the Assyrian News Agency and Half the places that are mentioned in it have been destroyed by ISIS now, so it's a rare piece of information. You can just have a look at that if you want to. This tells the story of the flood. And instead of Noah, we, we have Gilgamesh and the boat he built to avoid, to avoid the flood. There is a digging that took place in a place called Tel El Farah, which shows evidence of the flood of 3000 BC. The flood was a universal story. It wasn't just uh, Egypt or Iran or Iraq that it happened. You have stories of the flood in Australia, in Canada, in different in Wales, and so on like that. It's a universal story. The only thing is that the one we're talking about is the Great Great Flood of Noah's time. So there is the story of the flood. And it's about a boat he built. I, I won't into all that because it's, it's quite long. But it took me about three weeks to read through the whole thing. But anyway, uh, he built a boat to avoid the flood, which was, got, which was called because the gods had been offended with all the Babel. You remember the word Babel, the Tower of Babel. And because of the clamour of all the humans, and the, he measured it in cubits and held it became wedged between two mountains. And the similarity between the Bible story and, and Gilgamesh is really astounding. There's on the left is the Babylonian story of Gilgamesh. And on the right is the story from the Bible of Genesis. First part, take the seed of all creatures aboard the ship, the Bible, and of every li living thing, of all flesh you shall bring. I boarded the ship and closed the door. The Bible, come into the ark, the Lord shut him in. So you can see the comparison between the two. Now this is the actual quote from it, the, the epic of Gilgamesh. In those days the world teemed, the people multiplied and the world bellowed like a bull. And the great god Anu, lord of the firmament, was aroused by the clamour and the gods said, the uproar of mankind is intolerable and sleep is no longer possible because of the babel, the noise. So the gods agreed to exterminate mankind, but the hero Gilgamesh was warned in the dream to tear down your house and build a boat. Let our beam equal our length. Let our decks be roofed like the vault that covers the abyss. Then take up to the boat the seed of all living creatures. And it goes on like that. It measured 120 cubits by 120 cubits. Now, a cubit is point, roughly 0.48 of a metre, so nearly half a metre. So imagine 120, anyone good at that scale? 120 halves. Well done, well done. I'll see you later, parent. <coughs> now, the thing is, that's fine if you want the people to read your laws or to read your proclamations or whatever. But what if you wanted your messages kept secret? You didn't want your enemies to read it. There's an early Greek story called Herodotus or Herodotus. And he lived in 420 BC. Now, he was either the first historian or the greatest spoofer that ever lived. You have, you have to make up your own mind. But what he did was, he described how they would send a message. And there's the king of the Persians 
Well, Xerxes was attacking the Greeks, and he was building up an armada to invade. But there's a Greek exile living in a foreign land. And obviously, he still had some feelings for his own his own country or his former country. So he sent a message to the Greeks to say, "Look, you're about to be attacked by Xerxes." And what they did was they had a silver mines at a place called Lurium, where every Greek citizen was entitled to a share of the silver they produced. But what they did was they diverted the money, the silver, from the individual citizens and they put it towards building up a fleet. And they were able to build up a fleet, the Persians. Now, how did the message get through to the Greeks? At that stage, they were using a wax tablet. So the exile knew that if he sent it on the wax tablet, the first thing, when the messenger was intercepted, they said, ah, this is what they're planning. So he scraped off all the wax, wrote the message underneath, on, on the slate, and then covered it with, with wax again. The only trouble was that the messenger got through, but everyone was going and scratching their heads and saying, what the hell is this, a blank slate? So the princess Gorbo was the daughter of Leonidas, and she realised that there could be a message underneath. This is according to Herodotus, you know, whether it's true or not. So she scraped off the wax to reveal the message, which, as I say, allowed the Greeks time to divert uh, the money from their silver mines. And they constructed the ships and beat off the enemy at the Battle of Salamis. Now, Herodotus also tells a lovely story of a slave who was sent to carry the message. Now, the method he describes is that the slave had his hair shaved completely, and they wrote the message on his skull, and let the hair grow. So you can imagine if it was an urgent message, you know, forget it. So by the time his hair grew, the battle would be well and truly over. But that brings us to the First World War, the story from the First World War. Communications were very, very bad, and there was a general wanted to advance. So the message he sent, sent was, send reinforcements, the general is going to advance. This is word of mouth. Send reinforcements, the general is going to advance. However, what came out at the far end was that, send reinforcements, the general is going to advance. <laughs> Obviously, this was before decimalization. <laughs> Now, how do we know all of this about the languages? And who translated all the languages? We have to jump forward from the hieroglyphics to the 19th century, when Napoleon invaded uh, Egypt. He brought scientists and botanists and mathematicians with him. And on one occasion, they found a huge stone, about a metre tall, which is known as the Rosetta Stone, and was used in the construction of a fort, Fort Julian, near the town of Rashid, otherwise known as Rosetta. And there's the actual stone. It's a famous, famous stone. There, there's um, a close-up of it. It was brought back to France. And again, all the learned men were looking around saying, what the hell is this? They're, they're lovely fish and duck and all this sort of stuff. So no one was able to translate the hieroglyphics. But there was a chap called Champollion, who was a gifted linguist. And he figured that it was written out in three different languages. It was written out in Greek, Demotic, there's the Demotic, and, uh, which means popular, and the Egyptian hieroglyphics. He recognised that Demotic was a form of Coptic, which he understood, and he also understood Greek. So he put the two together and said, yeah, they're, they are the same. And he reckoned then that the hieroglyphics of the top would be the same. Now, up to that, People thought that the hieroglyphics were just pretty pictures. And you see the, the, the Egyptian there saying, what's it say? The other fellow says, bird eye, wiggly line, beetle goose flower, lump bird snake. So obviously people had no clue what it was. Now this interpretation opened the doors to scholars to unlock the ancient hieroglyphics. The first thing they found was the name of the pharaoh, pharaohs, Ptolemy, Ramses, Cheops, anyone who's ever been in the will know the Cheops pyramid, and Nefertiti, said to be the most beautiful woman that ever lived. Now, 
there, there's the famous Nefertiti. Some people reckon that she was the mother of Tutankhamun. If not, it was another queen called Kia. And that's probably where they get the Kia, you know, like the card, Kia, Kia. But it's not yet, not yet known which was the mother. There's the dad himself. Now, this was the first pharaoh's tomb to be found intact in Egypt. Because all the other tombs had been vandalized in ancient times and looted. But when Herod Carter was digging in the Valley of the Kings, he found the tomb intact. And it had been sealed 3,000 years previously and was still intact. And he found the beautiful mask of Tutankhamun inlaid with lapsus lazuli. And there's the cartouche of Tutankhamun. The cartouche was a sacred rope that was around to protect the name of the pharaoh. So if you look at the one on the right hand side, uh, the top one there is the name of God, Amun, which is written first but pronounced last. There's a little bird there and there's two loaves of bread. So the loaf of bread on either side is T, the bird stands for U, T. So it's T U T. To the right of that is the Ankh. The, you're familiar with the Ankh. You've all seen the Ankh from time to time. That's the sign of life. So in other words, it's Tut Ankh Amun, and the, the, God, the God's name at the top. That was his birth name, if you like. Then he had several other names. I'm not going to go into them here, but his coronation name was... The bottom one there is, represents gold, or a body, and body... Gold was the most precious thing, and body was. So he's Lord of the many. To see the three bars, the many forms of Re or Ra. Ra was the sun god. And they had this belief that every morning the, the scarlet beetle rolled the sun across for the day, and then in the evening rolled it back again. So this, is, this was his. So it's Lord of the many forms of Re or Ra. It's sometimes called Ra, that this is the sun. Where did the word cartouche comes, come from? The French uh, soldiers used a paper bullet with the ends crimped and the gunpowder was inside it. So in order to fire it, you had to tear off the top, pour it into your musket, ram it home and then fire it. And this gave rise to the, rise to the expression in America of biting the bullet. Because when you bit it, more than likely you swallow half the, the gunpowder and you, you end up probably nearly half choking yourself. So if you're biting the bullet, you're doing something very, very difficult or very unpleasant. So moving on several centuries now, uh, one of the most perfect examples of writing, or in fact carving, this is where it started really, is the, which is the basis of our modern typeface, Times New Rome. And if you look at the top, it says, Senatus Populus Quae Romanus. And everywhere the Roman legions went, they had this SPQR, for and, behalf, for and on behalf of the people of Rome. SPQR. If you look down the third line, it says Trajan. So Trajan had this, he was the emperor, he had it set up when he defeated the Dacians, or the Bulgarians. And that's there in Rome since 113 AD. All our modern letters come from this, from this Times New Roman, as it's called. Writing continued to develop in the 3rd century in Italy. And after a period of peace and prosperity in the Roman Emperor, Rome suddenly found itself under attack from the Goths and the Visigoths. They not only attacked Rome, but they attacked each other. And the Romans sent out several legions to beat them off, but they were actually soundly beaten at the Battle of Alia, where the Romans, under Quintus Sulpicius, were soundly defeated, and Rome was sacked and burnt to the ground, and all Roman records were destroyed. So all these attacks mainly lasted from the 3rd century to the 4th century. And the earliest surviving manuscripts are from around the period 400 AD to 600 AD. Now, two types of writing I just mentioned in passing. One is the Om or Ogham alphabet, and the other one are the runes. The, the Om alphabet was normally carved on the tombstone. It said something like, John, son of Oshin, 
buried here, and John, son of Oshin, was killed. So it had to be obviously a simple little thing. This was completely unknown until they actually found um, the book of Ballymote, and inside was the key to this alphabet. There is Q written in it. There is the ancient Irish of, of, of the own. So you had Sal, which is a willow, is marked with the X. And then you had Dar, which is the oak. And you may know the Sally Gardens down in, in the Phoenix Park. That comes from Salix, meaning willow. So the Sally Gardens comes from that. I hope. It sounds good anyway, doesn't it? <laughs> So there's the book of Barry Mote with the actual key to, to the Ogham, Ogham or Ogham. It comes, it's named after the Celtic god of writing, Omus. There is the book of Barry Mote. There are the runes. These were used by the Norse people. And these were in use in Dublin in the 9th century. If you go into Dublinia, as myself and my daughter went on one occasion, you'll see all these runes and all the messages. And they stood for strength, the self, fertility, uh, harvest, and so on like that. Now, a few manuscripts survived from, from the Middle Ages on fragments of papyrus, but most are on parchment. Meanwhile, in Ireland, up to the 9th century, and in Lindisfarne, and possibly Owen, illuminated manuscripts were being produced in Scriptoria, where they would have the scribes doing them such as the Book of Kells. Now, this is from the Book of Kells, and if you look across the top, it says L-I-B-E-R, Lieber, which is the book of G-E-N, it's the peculiar looking N, see the red in the middle, E-R-A-T-I-O-N, Yezu. So it's the book of the generations of Christ. So it, it gives all Jesus' forefathers, and so it's the genealogy of Christ. There is another one, uh, again from the book he has, Autem Pregnantibus in Ilius de Diebus, from Luke. How dreadful it would be for pregnant women in those days. And that's written in a style called uh, Insular or Irish Unseal. That's another one, another page. Qui uh, Autem Generatio Sic Erat, Now the Birth of Christ was June. And that XPI is the Greek name for, for Christ. That's a uh, key. And it's, it's called Key Row. And it's a famous page from. Now, if you look there, so it's XPI, Outem, A U T. Now, the U has a T built into it. So on the right hand side, there's a T. E and the M as well. So, we, you know, they, they have them all squashed in together. And it's very hard to read it. And that's from Matthew. There is the Irish Unseal. Now, that's the Irish Unseal in use. And that was a book I wrote by hand 25 years ago. And that C at the corner, it was supposed to be the story of Tala, how Tala got its name. It was 1% accurate, 99% fiction. And you can imagine, I have a vivid imagination, so you can imagine what it's like. Unfortunately, I gave the original to a friend of mine, which had all the, the things coloured in, and she lost it, so that, that's all. There's, it, there's no longer a copy of it available, but here in Tallaght, should be one in Tallaght, but if you go into Pierce Street Library, there is one copy there. I had part of it, and I lost some of it, so I managed to retrieve it all, anyway. Came a stranger to the door, weary, hungry, and foot sore. Said the sentry in a voice quite clear, What manner of man approaches here? Sir, got some food and lodging I crave, ere I pass away to a watery grave. My name is Maktuba of Northern Shore, and I beg you admit me through the door. I carry no weapon to do you wrong, but earn my keep with stories and song.
and the boss and the, oh, rubbish, 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 you know, there's more of it. Now, this is in turn superseded by Gothic or black letter or Carolingian. And you, you would all maybe familiar, be familiar with the German. They, they still use that on, on some of the writings, the, the one in the middle, the rotunda or the fracture. Now, they called it Gothic. They thought it had been invented by the barbarians. But an Italian Flavio Biondo thought it was invented by the Lombards after their invasion in the 6th century. But he was incorrect. Uh, it was actually invented in the reign of Charlemagne in 789 AD under the supervision of an English monk called Alcuin. This became the basis for all, the, for all the other scripts in the modern world. There's the Gothic or black letter again. In the 14th century, the development called Chancery emerged under in the reign of Henry V. And this was actually used in the Chancery, the Lateran Chancery in Rome. This in turn was replaced in the 15th century by Italic. And you, you would all be familiar with uh, Italic. Developed by, now this, this really goes to test me, Ludovico Arecchi and Aldous Manichus. So, take it early, that's the best you can do it. And this is still in use today, this typeface, both as a handwriting and a printing device. There's the flourished italic, which is, you know, it's too easy to do the basic letters, so they start adding tails and curlicues and everything to it. That's a, no a normal italic. This led to the development in the Arab world of calligraphy. Under Muslim law, you can't actually represent a human form. But what they did was, they worked the calligraphy in, into all sorts of shapes. And that's actually a boat. I don't know what the text is. I haven't got, haven't got around to learning uh, Arabic yet. But anyway, it's a shape of a boat. And you're going to guess what that is? I, I don't know. It's a bird of some sort, anyway. <coughs> Obviously, a pair. Mm -hmm. Now, there's uh, one pound is two and nine pence, if anyone can identify this, in your three seconds. Ice cream bowl. No, no. At the other, something like that. No, no. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, Al Jazeera. That's, that's the moniker for Al Jazeera. This is a poem. Desiderata. And there's one for everyone in the audience. Now, obviously, the Pharaohs and the Gospel books were meant to be read. But what if you did not want your messages read? Again, we have the codes. So, this led to the further development of codes. The most basic is a substitution code, where one letter is replaced by another. You have your basic alphabet, which is the black. And that's replaced by, say, K equals A, L equals B, M equals, and so on like that. So, T-O in the original one, in the black, becomes D-Y in the red, and O-R becomes Y-B. So, the word tool becomes D-Y-Y-V, or beer becomes l -O, o b Now, for a crypto analyst, that's a godsend, when the letter repeats itself. They know it's the same thing, so it's very easy to actually um, figure out a code. And this sort of code can be broken literally in about two minutes, because there's common words like and, and then, and if, and by. So once you get those, you know, it's very easy to break. Now, there was an Arab in the 9th century called Al Kindle, and he figured out how to break codes. There is a sample of 40,000 words. And of those, the letter E was 21,900, the letter T was 16,587, letter A, 14,000, and so on like that. So, by working at the distribution, you could figure out what the code was. Over the centuries, there have been many attempts to develop an unbreakable code. And this is the code of Mary Queen of Scots. That, that's her original cipher and for with that if, where there's the form by the soul like that. Now, Walsingham was 
Lisbeth the First, her spy master. And he was trying to get information on Mary Queen of Scots. And he used every trick you could think of to implicate her in a plot against Elizabeth. Walsingham's cryptographer succeeded in breaking Mary's code. Now, he was aware that there were a group of Catholics who planned to assassinate Elizabeth, but he did not have definite details. So he set up watch on a young nobleman named Babington and a Jesuit priest named John Ballard, who came from Rome and was captured almost as soon as he stepped off the boat. He turned John Ballard and made him into a spy. Ballard later tried to recant what he had said, said, no, no, I, I didn't mean that, I, it wasn't true, but he was executed. Now, on one occasion, Philip Stubbs, Walsingham's cryptographer, added a, a, a cheeky little note uh, to one of the messages. I'll tell you how the messages were sent later on. And what he said was something along the lines of, oh, by the way, um, I'm not too sure of all the conspirators involved in the plot. I know some of them, but if you could give me names of some of the other ones who were involved, at which they duly gave him the names, and they, they too were executed. He actually succeeded in breaking the code. He got Mary to commit herself. Now, what she did was, as she was a royal personage, she was entitled to a barrel of wine a day. So she got the barrel of wine, all innocent enough, and drank the wine, but in the bum of the barrel, there was a message. So she could get the message from her supporters, and then she changed the message around, stick the bun and send back the empty barrel. But the, the trouble was that he could read them all, every single message she sent. And she never committed herself until the 7th of July, 1586, when she responded in code on the 17th of July to Babington's message. And she ordered her followers to assassinate Queen Elizabeth if that was necessary for her release. And when Walsingham saw this, he drew a sketch of a noose on, on the, as much as say, gotcha. Now, Mary refused to accept that she was guilty of treason, but her secretaries, Nall and Curl, under torture, revealed that it was mainly truthful. Many experts re reckon that the letter was a forgery and was done by her maid, Mary Seaton, who would be familiar with her writing and could easily forge a signature. You may have heard of the song, The Four Marys. Last night the Queen had four Marys. Tonight there be but three. There was Mary Seaton, Mary Beaton, Mary Carmichael and me. The, uh, Mary Queen of Scots. Moving forward several hundred years, we had serious attempts at creating a code. The first successful one was Morse's Code. That started in 1832 and was in use for over 150 years until it was replaced by, now we hear the name, the alternative name for Morse Code. Global Maritime Distress Safety System Satellite Technology in 1989, they replaced it. It's said that the idea came to Morse, a voyage to Ireland. And there is how he actually constructed the letters. So A is dot dash, B is dash dot dot dot, C is dash dot dash dot, E is dot, and so on, so on like that. All the way through. So it's all based on the shape of the letters. Now, a dot is a single B. A dash is three seconds longer. The first message that Samuel Morse sent was, what God had wrought. Another way of sending a code was by means of an innocuous letter. Now, I was trying to prepare this letter, and it's using lemon juice. You could also use um, various other minerals, right on the shell of an egg. Now, I wrote out the message, and the message was that, uh, thank you for a lovely birthday present. It was a nice surprise. Talk to you soon. And I wrote the secret message underneath it. The trouble was, when I heated it with a candle, I nearly set the house on fire. <laughs> now, this is an example of Morse code. And in the example, the thumb is swiping to the right. That's a dot. And when it swipes to the left, it's a dash. Now, the letter A is dot, dash. And repeats it. Dot, dash. Letter B. Dash dot dot dot. E is just a dot. M is dash dash.
The next section I want to speak about is semaphore. This was invented by the French Chap brothers in 1790 and it is based on the clock system A, B, C, D and so on like that. The first letter is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, Hello. H, E, L, L, O. Now this is a machine called the Difference Engine, which was invented by Charles Babbage. And he milked the British government for all that he was worth. Every time he got his half working, and then he'd go to the British government again and say, oh, by the way, uh, I had a few problems, can you give me another 50,000? This went on, eventually they out. forget it. No, it just wasn't working. As the second line of defence, the Germans had the Enigma machine. And the Enigma means puzzle, and again it comes from the Greek. You folks who, who can type. If you look across the first line, it's Q-W-E-R-T-Z-U-I-O. And then the bottom line is P-Y-X-C. The way the Enigma machine worked was that the earlier ones had only three rotors. So if you press the letter H, for example, it came out as K. If you pressed H again, it came out as L. So it never repeated itself. And the whole idea was that every day the operator would set the rotors. He'd be given the preset instructions. So rotor number one would be for today. Tomorrow, rotor number two. Now there's the original one, the possible combinations. For day one, you could have rotor number one was the prime rotor. Rotor number two is the next one. Rotor number three, next one. Next day, you could have rotor number three is the main one. Rotor number one. And that the nine is oh, letter O. Moving on to the green section. Letter F becomes three. Nine again is O. And ten is R. So, so on like that. There is an example of what's known as the famous Zimmerman telegram, which was sent by the Germans in 1917 to the Mexican embassy. And what they said was, listen lads, if you join in with us, we'll see that you get independence. But it was intercepted by the Allies, and they were able to break the code. Again, there's the enigma. The trouble was that they made it more difficult by adding extra wheels. So initially, right, they had the three wheels, then they made four, then they made five. And the British had two Polish workers who had been actually forced under construction to make this Enigma machine. So they escaped to England and they brought a copy of it. They were able to manufacture a copy of it. And all through the war, from 1943 onwards, every single message that the Germans sent, they were able to read. Now, Montgomery had access to this, but he didn't know what, what the source was. All he knew was that Rommel will be at Wadi Haifa on Tuesday the 5th. He was never told how they arrived at that. So, fair enough, Rommel was at Wadi Haifa El Alamein, and Montgomery beat him and defeated him. Then Rommel retreated. Of course, that affect this, he chased after him. And he was nearly wiped out because he'd gone past the ultra code. You know, he hadn't got the information. So he was actually reprimanded over it and nearly lost his command as a result of it. The first break they had was an operative was sending a, a text. Now he set the wheels according to the correct order for the day. First thing he sent was spruch number two is the next one, road number three. Next one. The next day you could have rotor number three as the main one, rotor number one, rotor number and so on. They were the only possible combinations. In Bletchley Park, they worked it out, and they worked it out manually, using the Al Kindle's uh, logic that I showed you earlier. They, the Germans thought this was 100% secure, totally unbreakable. It had a fatal flaw, though. It was based on a hand coding system, which dated back to the First World War and which the Allies were very familiar with, and had even been explained in a book in 1931. <clears throat> there were several systems called the Vinigieri system, which dated back to Napoleonic times, 
or the Playfair system. But again, I'm not going to go oh, up, there's so many codes there. The key word here is Ireland. So the key word here is Ireland. That would be the word you would be using for the day. It could be Britain or whatever. It could be whatever your keyword was that only you know. Certain spaces were blocked off according to the numbers assigned to the keyword. In this case, the I from Ireland is the ninth letter of the alphabet. So you would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, and you would block off the grid. Then the next letter would be the letter closest to the start of the alphabet, or. So that's blocked out it's for the second red box, because that's the 17th letter in the alphabet. Now, if the intended message was reading across the top, US 5th Division arrived in Belfast. So that's the original message I sent. <coughs> this will be then enciphered and sent in group. It's, it took me about an hour and a half to figure this out. So I, I put in the codes to make it even easier, but probably made it harder. These were sent in groups of five letters. So the first one is the letters A and D. So we have reading downwards, F-I-R-T-H. That was the first group of letters. And the way it worked was that you went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards through the columns. So you go left and then you swing right. And as I say, it was a well-known system. Now this was then converted to a number sequence. So the actual message was, it took years for him to realise the US 5th Division arrived at Belfast yesterday, heavy tanks and machine guns. So then each letter is assigned a number. So you get 5 for I, 12 for T, 12 for T. And as I said, the beauty of a letter repeating is that, ah, you can see 12 is obviously T because it's repeating. Now there's two examples highlighted, 9 and 9 and 6. And that the 9 is o, letter O. Moving on to the green section, letter F becomes 3, 9 again is O, and 10 is R, so, so on like that. There is an example of what's known as the famous Zimmermann telegram, which was sent by the Germans in 1917 to the Mexican embassy. And what they said was, listen guys, if you join in with us, we'll see if you get independence. But it was intercepted by the Allies, and they were able to break the code. Again, there's the enigma. The trouble was that they made it more difficult by adding extra wheels. So initially, right, they had the three wheels, then they made four, then they made five. And the British had two Polish workers who had been actually forced under construction to make this enigma machine. So they escaped to England and they brought a copy of it, or they were able to manufacture a copy of it. And all through the war, from 1943 onwards, every single message that the Germans sent, they were able to read. Now, Montgomery had access to this, but he didn't know what, what the source was. All he knew was that Rommel will be at Wadi Haifa on Tuesday the 5th. He was never told how they arrived at that. So, fair enough. Ronald was at Wadi Haifa El Alamein and Montgomery beat him and defeated him. Then Ronald retreated. Of course, Montgomery, he chased after him and he was nearly wiped out because he'd gone past the ultra code. You know, he hadn't got the information. So he was actually reprimanded over it and nearly lost his command as a result of it. The first break they had was an operative was sending a, a text. Now, he set the wheels according to the correct order for the day. First thing he sent was Spruch number, which was a standard message number. That was spelled as S-P-R-U-C-H-N-U-M-M-E-R. And he got back a reply saying, sorry mate, didn't get all of that, could you repeat it? So you can just imagine him saying, for oops sake, imagine having to send another 4,000 words. So he abbreviated the second message. So instead of Spruch number, he put S-P-R-U-C-H-N-R. Bill Truth was um, a post office engineer, and he was looking at this, and he reckoned that, yeah, the message was essentially the same, but it was 500 words shorter. And from that, he was able to break the code. Because obviously, the, the soldier was trying to save his fingers tapping out the, the message. An analyst under the leadership of Dr. Alan Turing, he was a mathematician and chess player, 
We're able to compare the messages and break the code by statistical analysis. Again, the one that we saw earlier on. As I said, the work was carried out in Bletchley Park. And Shane Ross, TV Shane Ross, was on the, on the radio about five or six months ago with his mother. And in the course of the conversation, she said, oh yeah, I was a code breaker at Bletchley Park. And his jaw dropped. He never knew a thing about it. For 50 years, she kept a secret that she was actually a, a secret code breaker. We had a limited number of code breakers. Dr. Richard Hayes, who was the director of the National Library and Coral of the time being. That's all we had. That was our intelligence service. There is the example of the bomb, which they used to decode the German messages. You can see it, it was really advanced at that stage. There was an agent, a German agent called Dr. Hermann Goetz, and he insisted on being parachuted into Ireland in full German uniform, wearing all his medals. And he was picked up within, within about two hours. So. Now, one thing they found was that he had loads of advertisements for Aspo. I said, what on earth is a German doing with advertisements for Aspo? And it was then that they found that each one had a microdot underneath. This was 1940. They had never heard of a microdot before that. But um, say like under the R for reason, there was a microdot, which would then be enlarged. If anyone is interested in a further explanation of the codes, there's a brilliant book by Mark M. Hull, which is called Irish Secrets. And he tells the story of a German agent who was parachuted down near Kerry. So he's walking along the railway line, he's trying to get to Dublin, and a policeman sees him, he said, um, can you tell me when the next train is going to Dublin? The policeman says, well, the last one was 40 years ago, so it'll be waiting for the next one. <laughs> now, this brings us on to binary. And binary is used in computers and in your kettle at home. Your, your vacuum cleaner. So it consists of two states, on or off. One is on and all is off. And when you're actually counting in binary, the first column is one. The next one is double that. The next one is double that. So you have one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. If you have a computer, you might have heard it's a sixteen bit computer or a thirty-two bit computer. That's, that's the capacity of it. So there's only one basic rule. 1 plus 1 is 1, and carry 1. So if we look at the second line, number, which is 2, 1 plus 1 is 1, and carry 1. So that comes out as 1, 0. That's 2. There's uh, the number 11, which is 1, 0, 1, 1, which is 8 plus nothing plus 2 plus 1. So it should work out 11. I can tell that it does. I always, I always check that just to make sure, just in case. There's another example. When I was looking about pixels there, I thought of the film, The Sixth Sense, where the guy says, I see dead people. So I came across this one about the pixels. I see dead pixels. Okay, there's your Morse sender, Morse key sender, which you've already heard. There's that bit. A is dot dash. Where do all these words come from? You may have heard the expression mayday, mayday as an emergency. That comes from the French, nadir, uh, which means help me. And as Red Butler might have said in Gone with the Wind, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> the last section is catastrophes. During the 13th century, the Mongols tried twice to invade. And each time they were beaten back by a storm. And the Japanese refer to this as a kamikaze, or divine wind, or divine spirit. And during the Second World War, and the ships were being attacked by the pilots on board who were of Japanese descent, called them kamikaze pilots. And it meant the divine wind. Catastrophes were very common. Uh, there's one, the Sussex in the 16th century, went down with only two survivors because they had no way of communicating. You're all familiar with the Spanish Armada, mm -hmm. where even the guys who made it ashore, the Spaniards who made it ashore, apparently were killed by the Irish. So they, they're coming over to help the Irish, and the Irish said, flip this, and they, they killed them. That's the standard 
CQD, CQD SOS MGY. Now, CQD means distress. CQ sounds like seek you. I'm looking for you, seek you. And that, that was developed in 1906 at a conference. Now, SOS was also developed in 1906. And the thing was, there were several proposals. One was SOS, which the Germans had suggested, SOS. You could, you could also have JBY and so on. Like that. Any three letters would have done. So CQD was emergency distress. So CQ is just, no, no, be jersey, but no, it's... That's a world's room from an early 20th century. To conclude, I want you to imagine that you are on a liner in the Atlantic. It's a cold night, but clear. The moon is shining. You hear something scraping along the side and you fall over. Now you look around embarrassed in case people think that you've had a few too many at the captain's table earlier on. So you pull yourself together and get up and you decide to go down to your cabin for a little rest. As you're going down to your cabin, you hear the newfangled Morse code being sent. You recognize it as Morse code because your friend Robert baden Powell, the founder of the Scouts, had taught it to you a few months earlier. You decide that there is something wrong when you're the CQD SOS. So you decide to head up on deck and not go back down to your cabin. It is just as well that you did, for the date is the 15th of April. The year is 1912. Because of your actions in going up on deck, you will be one of the survivors from the Titanic. Once again, folks, thank you very much. The next lecture is on Tuesday, the 13th of October, and it's the sinking, strangely enough, the sinking of the Lusitania. Lusitania. Yeah, that's by our great friend Carl. So, the, the good one there, Tuesday, the 13th of October, the sinking of the Lusitania by Carl. In the meantime, thanks very much. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Uh, a wonderful lecture. Thank you.